Welcome to a special edition of The Spectator Podcast, except this isn't really a podcast. Every week during lockdown, we are asking three of our writers to read out what they've written for the magazine. The idea is that normally our magazine is passed between readers and their friends, so each article can be read two, three, four, or even five times. But this won't be happening so much now that we're not allowed to see each other. So first we have Rachel Johnson reading her diary, then we have Paul Wood about the uh, morality of um, COVID testing and the new backstreet testings which have crept up, and then finally we have Simon Barnes about the beauty and the art and the point of boxing. First, Rachel Johnson. When the post office and stores closed in our village on Exmoor, my youngest stared out of the car window as we drove past and saw its dreaded closed sign and for sale placard outside for the first time. That's my whole childhood, he wailed. Gone. As an over 50 who's had peak everything, I can't complain, out loud anyway. But I find the losses for younger generations too painful to contemplate. No travel, no parties, no pubs, no clubs, no sport, no sex, no education. A life unlived online for the foreseeable. Given how badly Oliver took that one tiny but vital enterprise shutting up shop, I've been surprised and impressed by how well millions have adapted to the closure of the country. Lockdown has worked because, against all expectation, there turned out to be many more acceptors and sufferers than resistors, the three pandemic personalities identified by King's College. I'm keeping a note of some of the less seismic adaptations. Everything is a family now. Pretty Patel speaks of the blue light family of emergency workers. Rishi Sunak of the health and social care family. Journalists of the superior ability of female leaders from Iceland to Taiwan to care for the human family. Even my shredded wheat packet. Meet the shredded wheat family, honey and nut spelt and barley, which somehow makes me think of a litter of cute blonde puppies. The ads that pop up on my screen are no longer for tea dresses and for some reason multivitamins, but plastic visors, rubber gloves and fashion paisley face mark. The ads that pop up on my screen are no longer for tea dresses and for some reason multivitamins, but plastic visors, rubber gloves and fashion paisley face masks. PR emails no longer hope I've been enjoying the lovely sunshine, but that I'm safe in these unprecedented and strange times. Well, that's one way of glossing how many of us have interpreted the wartime instructions to stay at home and save lives by binging on banana bread and box sets for six weeks while forwarding funny TikToks on WhatsApp. Amazon, Facebook, Zoom, Google... They're corporate winners and Captain Tom's one of the many heroes. But my friend Mary Killen of this parish is a nation's sweetheart, starring as she does with her husband Giles Wood from their Wiltshire cottage, aka the Grottage, on Gogglebox. As we sit on our sofas, scoffing our homemade banana bread, it turns out that what we love is a teleprogramme that reflects our own selves back to us, i.e., a nation of people on sofas watching a television show about more people on sofas watching television. This contagious solipsism has made our own dear, surely soon, Dame Mary, the Vera Lynn of Covid. Why is fishing banned? Why are golf courses closed and public tennis courts padlocked? given that these are healthful and wholesome activities that can be enjoyed while accommodating health and safety guidelines. I asked my husband, who used to work for the National Trust, which has closed its entire estate. It's the car parks, he said. They're worried people won't socially distance on the tarmac. While I see lockdown as a go-to-jail card, my husband regards it as a golden ticket. I never want it to end, I overhear him chuckling on the landline to male chums as I return from the shops laden with his wine, whiskey, fruit and nut and cigarettes. It's so peaceful not seeing anyone. We used to joke Brexit saved our marriage as we were so united in the Remain cause. Readers must join me in Zoom prayers 
that what Europe hath joined together, let not COVID-19 put asunder, especially when I hear him chuckle as he lights up a Marlborough. It's what I've always wanted. I may never go back to London again. What I can't do from Exmoor, where we've been since March, before Locke was downed, is present my new show on LBC. Our Wi-Fi is weaker than m and Jinna Tin, and I wouldn't know how. I have key worker status and can travel for work that I can't do from home. Last week, I left the West Country for the first time in six weeks and headed into a deserted Leicester Square in a taxi that had a plastic visor to shield me and the driver from any diseased droplets. I was soon with my own muff, technical term, alone in the studio, everyone else sitting in the gallery. Halfway through, they played a clip of the Kiwi ICU nurse who'd looked after the PM and there was nothing for it. I had to say something about my brother's life-saving treatment at St Thomas's. I wish I'd said it better and said it differently and said more, but the key message was, thank you. I thought I'd have to take out a large onion to show emotion, but the tears almost came to my eyes anyway. Oh yes, and I can't count how many listeners started calls to me with the kind words, welcome to the LBC family. This week, no doubt, I will be accepting continuing congratulations for becoming an auntie again, which is all splendid. That was Rachel Johnson. Now here's Paul Wood. My friend, let's just call him by his initial D, is an instantly recognisable type in the Middle East, the middleman. He's always chasing the next deal, always about to make millions. One scheme was to build a London Eye in a fly-blown town in the Levant. Another was to buy a Trump sex tape for $10 million. He invited me to watch the negotiations. They ended with a sociopathic Russian gangster ringing up in the night, threatening to kill my children. We know where you live. His latest scheme is to get the British government to buy coronavirus test kits from Turkey. This could be the big score for biotech companies testing is a new gold rush. And though there's a touch of Dell Boy about my friend, he's right about the need for test kits. In fact, to get out of the crisis caused by the coronavirus, we might have to test on an immense, unprecedented, almost unimaginable scale. As Dee will be overjoyed to learn, 34 experts have written a joint letter to the British government saying that every single person in the country should be tested once a week. That's 10 million tests a day. The 34 experts are mostly professors of epidemiology or public health. There's also a Nobel Prize winner in economics. They're calling not just for mass testing, but for universal testing. That's never been done in a large country like the UK. Their letter was published by The Lancet, and the authors argue that without universal testing and selective quarantine, Britain will be stuck in a cycle of relaxing and then reimposing the lockdown with fresh surges in the epidemic each time. They write, These cycles will kill tens and perhaps hundreds of thousands of people before a vaccine becomes available. The letter was organised by Julian Pito, a professor of epidemiology at the London School of Hygiene. He's 74 and a bit of a curmudgeon. He tells me the government got the wrong advice from the wrong people modellers and sociologists. He says, the modellers were bloody useless because they didn't put the right thing in their model. The sociologists were bloody useless because they thought people wouldn't put up with the lockdown until there was a big pile of corpses. Nobody thought of just testing. It's bloody obvious that they didn't. Peter says that with universal testing, only the infectious would have to be kept at home. He thinks that might be 1-2% to of the population and would quickly drop to almost nothing. He goes on, this is a way to go straight back to normal life. If someone tested positive for the virus, the whole household would have to quarantine themselves. He says strict quarantine is very, very important. That's the only thing to take this disease out of communities. I don't care if we get herd immunity. I don't want to kill 200,000 people and ruin the economy. The Lancet letter is talking about the swab test, which shows if you have the virus not the antibody test, which, roughly speaking, shows if you have had it. A swab is taken from the nose or mouth and tested to see if there's genetic material from the virus. 
The trouble is that the analysis is done with a specialised piece of lab equipment called a PCR machine. The government has scooped up some that were in private hands and has been centralising the work in a few labs. This has meant, firstly, that test results can take days to come back, and secondly, that the government has struggled to reach its target of 100,000 tests a day for NHS staff and key workers. Peto and the other signatories of the letter have worked out that to do 10 million tests a day would take 14,000 machines working constantly. No problem, he says. Almost every single lab in the country has a PCR machine. There are certainly more than 14,000. If only the government would trust individual scientists to get on with the work. He says, it didn't occur to me until I thought about it that we did actually have the firepower to test everyone. You could even rig up a test without specialised equipment, with little more than a water bath at 63 degrees Celsius, a saucer and a thermometer, the so-called RT lamp test. This slightly balmy Heath Robinson approach appeals to the spirit of Dunkirk that Peter and his colleagues want to invoke, a flotilla of small labs, private and university, coming together to save the nation. His group says that national testing would cost about £14 billion a year, that, they say, is a small fraction of the economic costs of lockdown. These ideas are controversial. Peter has been attacked in a blog post by Liam Smith, who happens to be the dean of his own faculty at the London School of Hygiene. No politics are as vicious as academic politics, as the old saying goes, precisely or usually because the stakes are so small, except now the stakes are extremely high. When the public inquiry into COVID-19 is held, it may be revealing to see what role academic rivalries played in the conflicting advice given to ministers. Professor Smee's blog post did make two important points. The first is that testing people a week apart could see the infectious out and about for days before the virus is detected and quarantine put in place. The second is to question whether Britain could get hold of the huge amounts of chemical reagents needed for 10 million tests a day, especially with every developed country in the world trying to buy the same thing. A month ago, the Deputy Prime Minister, as we may call him, Michael Gove, said that a shortage of reagents was holding up testing. I asked the Chemical Business Association, which represents chemical suppliers in the UK, if this was true. Its chief executive, Peter Newport, said that following Gove's remarks, he'd asked ministers what exactly was needed. He was still waiting to hear back. He thought it was quite possible to provide the raw materials for Professor Pito's 10 million tests a day, though the complex reagents would have to be made by biotech companies. Anthony Bellum, who runs a biotech company called Apacor, told me this could be done on a big enough scale for national testing. He said, it's going to cost an awful lot, but it's possible. He said his company's offer of test kits for the NHS had been ignored until the Daily Mail wrote about it. It was a similar story for the company represented by my friend, the Turkish middleman. They offered to supply 100,000 tests a day, but they never heard back. Pito is outraged. He tells me, I'm sure we can bloody well make enough, and if not, we can buy it. It can't be done because you haven't got enough reverse transcriptase. Tell that to Churchill in 1939. One government minister I spoke to told me that a national system of testing for everyone, even those without symptoms, wasn't worth the trouble and expense because the swab test could be unreliable. This can happen because a good enough swab isn't taken, or perhaps there's a mistake with the reagents. As much as 30% of the time it can give a false negative, disastrously telling people they're safe to leave home when they're not. The minister said that only those with symptoms should be tested, followed by a rigorous effort to find everyone they've been near, then isolating everyone with the virus. This is the system of test, track and trace planned by the Health Secretary Matt Hancock, first for key workers, then for others. The problem, say supporters of universal testing, is that it might work only when the number of cases is very low. Soon the system gets overwhelmed, another lockdown is imposed and the whole cycle starts again. A report by the Safra Centre for Ethics at Harvard University supports test, track and trace, calling for 20 million Americans to be tested every day. But the report also concedes 
that this might not keep up with the virus. And it says that testing 100 million Americans a day could be the only way to avoid another lockdown. This is universal testing. But what about the antibody test? This is the test to show whether you've had the virus and have built immunity to it. Surely this is the way to avoid the whole country living under the yoke of constant testing. Antibody tests are certainly quick and easy. You prick your finger and put a couple of drops of blood on something that looks very much like a pregnancy test. Some of these are circulating in Notting Hill, a new W11 status symbol. It's a question of knowing the right venture capitalist, apparently. But for now, antibody tests are more unreliable than the swab test. And even if you've had the virus, no one knows yet how long you keep your immunity. Even worse, if the antibody test is done too early, you could appear immune but still be shedding the virus. The antibody test alone may not tell you who's infectious. So far, the debate has been about whether to ease the lockdown slowly and get to a final total of people who've had coronavirus in a way that doesn't overwhelm our hospitals, or whether to ease it quickly, hoping that the Swedish model is right and you arrive at the same destination with less catastrophic damage to the economy. There's a kind of fatalism to both positions, a belief that eventually a certain number of people will get the virus, as many crematorium fires will be lit either way. The advocates of universal testing and selective quarantine don't accept that. Like Lowe's cartoon of a British soldier standing on a rock and shaking his fist at the enemy, very well, alone, they would like to remain defiant in the face of dispiriting odds. Perhaps this is an image that may appeal to our Prime Minister as he gets back to work after his convalescence. That was Paul Woods, and finally Simon Barnes. Why do we box? It's an almost ludicrously inefficient form of combat. The last thing the SAS suggests its soldiers to do is put their dukes up. But boxing is nonetheless the world's leading combat sport. Millions watch boxing in lockdown, and when we're allowed out, thousands will head first to the pub, then out into the streets and car parks to throw punches at each other's heads. Why? I have the answer. It came to me by a combination of Joanna Lumley and a fight I once witnessed between cobras. Boxing is not a great form of combat, not if your aim is to put your opponent out of action fast. But Joanna, visiting a boxing gym in Cuba for a recent television programme, made a crucial point. It's the most natural thing in the world. You put your fists up. She was right. There are Sumerian images of boxing 5,000 years old. Evidence for boxing has been found in ancient Babylon and on Egyptian papyrus. Boxing was part of the Olympic Games in 688 BC. What's more, when Volters fought Hasset in the Battle of 2X at Emmanuel School, they put their fists up. When my neighbour Archun on Lama Island, Hong Kong, took exception to a visiting Japanese engineer, he conveyed his reproof with swinging fists. It's what people do. It seems not to vary from culture to culture. It's a human thing. If you want to win a fight, the default ploy is to kick your opponent in the balls and then perhaps in the head. Saves untold trouble. But boxers don't do that because it's against the rules, and barroom fighters tend not to either, because there seems to be a powerful inhibition that stops them. So people swing punches at heads, and the problem is that unless you're wearing boxing gloves, it hurts. Hitting bone against bone isn't smart. Ben Stokes, the England cricketer, broke his wrist punching a locker after he was out first ball, and had to miss the World T20 Championship. Later he was in trouble for a street fight over zealously protecting a gay couple, demonstrating that it hurts less when your fists are anaesthetised by alcohol. The pain in the aggressor's hands acts as a safety measure. Padded gloves were introduced into boxing by the Marquis of Queensbury in 1867. 
They don't protect boxers from the savagery of bare-knuckle fighting. They protect their hands so they can land serious concussive blows in comparative comfort. Boxing is a highly specialised form of combat, a limited target and fists that don't hurt. So let's get to those cobras. The most efficient way for a cobra to win a fight is obvious. After all, they are armed with large fangs that inject lethal venom. But the two male snakes I saw fighting in Sri Lanka weren't trying to bite each other. Instead, they were wrapped round each other like a stick of barley sugar and were trying to bear each other to the ground. Lethal creatures choosing a non-lethal form of combat. It's a pattern you can find repeated again and again. Impala rams don't try to gore each other's entrails out. They lock horns. Humpback whales posture at each other. Birds sing. Many primate species fight and make up again, as explained in Franz de Waal's classic work of ethology, Peacemaking Among Primates, in which he contends that the reconciliations are more important than the combat. Lethal combat is far from unknown in many species, but generally speaking, it's the last resort and happens when two equal males can't resolve a dispute any other way. As a generalisation, combat is a genuine test of skill, strength and experience, but lives are not often at risk. Ritual predominates over lethal danger. And that is why humans box. Boxing is not efficient, but it's not supposed to be efficient. The whole idea is that it's inefficient. It hurts the hands too much to carry on for long, but it's quite good at sorting out the winner from the loser. As a bonus, the loser carries the marks of combat for a good week or so afterwards. Black eyes, a swollen nose, cut lips, red ears. An advertisement of his opponent's enhanced or retained status. Hence the ancient jest, you should see the other guy. More dangerous forms of combat are mostly rejected. People sometimes get dangerously carried away with a fallen opponent, but in the main, a punch-up is an effective way of settling a dispute with minimal damage. It hurts and humiliates, sure, but both parties walk away. In Neville Shute's novel The Checkerboard, Corporal Dougie Brent is a commando who takes his combat training into a pub. He has lost his appreciation of pub fight etiquette, unintentionally kills his man, and is tried for murder. Murder is not supposed to happen in a pub fight. I had always assumed that the fist-fighting convention came from watching boxing or from watching films in which characters throw massive punches without sustaining so much as a sore knuckle. But where did boxers or filmmakers get their ideas from? The fact is that fist-fighting is an archetypal form of combat. It's the way people fight when they're not fighting for their lives. In normal circumstances, when people fight for honour or precedence or access to females, they put their fists up. And afterwards, though the winner is a good deal happier than the loser, they carry on living and breathing, as cobras do. That was Simon Barnes, and that's all from our podcast, I'm not even quite sure what to call it, our audio reads. Um, if you can think of a good name, then do let us know on podcast at spectator.co.uk. We're always very keen to hear from you guys, especially um, during lockdown. If you've got any thoughts about the format of this particular podcast or any of our other podcasts, then do let us know. Normally we'd get together in the editor's office and brainstorm, but we can't do so much of that nowadays. So with your help, I'm sure we can... Um, get a little bit better. Thanks very much for listening and thanks to Cindy Yu, our producer. <laughs> <laughs>